Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Welcome to Think Tech Global on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host today, Carol Man Lee. Our show is called Corporate Law Practice in Hong Kong's Hospitality Industry, specifically about practicing international labor and employment law and how UH Law School prepares its graduates as international lawyers. If you want to ask a question or make a comment, you can tweet us at ThinkTechHI or call us at 374-2014. International lawyer Jing Wu returns to Hawaii after spending a decade working in Asia as an international labor and employment specialist, both in private practice and as in-house counsel. He talks about his current position in the hospitality industry as vice president and senior counsel for Marriott International in Hong Kong. A graduate of UH Richardson School of Law, Jing Wu has also practiced in Beijing and Shanghai. Welcome, Jing Wu. Thank you, Carol. So good to see you again after 10 years. Yes. <laughs> so tell us, you're here in Hawaii for the first time and on your way back from a uh, corporate... Uh, legal summit in legal Washington, D.C. Yeah, on behalf of Marriott, right? Yes. So what do you do for Marriott as the uh, vice president and uh, in-house counsel? So for me, I'm the in-house labor employment lawyer for Marriott International. It's practice in Asia Pacific. I look after the company's uh, labor employment operations in Asia, in all 30 countries, 30 brands. In 30 countries? Yes. All in Asia? Yes. I see. Uh -huh. So for us, we are a hotel management company. We call ourselves operators. Then we help to manage, actively manage all these hotels in Asia. We have about 30 brands after we merged with Starwood. Wow, so are you the largest hospitality company in the world? Uh, we are one of the largest international brands in, right. in the world. Uh, we have a large footprint in Asia. Sure, how many, how do you measure that? Is it, do you measure it by the number of hotels? I know you mentioned 30 brands. Yeah, we measure by the number of hotels, a number of the rooms, we call keys, number of employees, a number of actively managed hotels. Mm -hmm. We do both franchise and act actively managed hotels. Okay, so about how many are we talking about? We are talking about like 600 to 700 actively managed hotels. And wow. every year we have new hotels it's to be opened in the pre-opening pipeline. Oh, no kidding. And so we're talking about Asia, Southeast Asia? Yeah, we're talking about South Africa, the far from India, Pakistan, in Bangladesh, the South Asia, Maldives, to French Polynesia. Wow. And do you have a large concentration in any particular um, area, China? Yes, China is always important by the volume. We have 40% of the hotels in China. For India, it's also very important. Now we have over 100 opening hotels in Asia, in India. In India, yes. my goodness. And they're under different brands. Marriott, we know Starwood, right? Yes, yes. Sheraton, Sheraton, Sandwiches, Westing. Weston, yes. right, and they're all under you. Yes, the Meridian, yes. Look at the hotel hospitality industry. Like most of the companies start with one brand, then over the year you acquire different brands and for whatever consumer strategy or the brand attraction or whatever market insight you get. So a lot of like, like Hilton also have multiple brands, Intercom have multiple brands. Right, so are those your biggest competitors? So they are like, we, it's a very small circle, so right. it's, we are friends, so we are like running it as these international players in Asia. There are a lot of local players in Asia, like, like Shangri-La. Of course, yes. Shangri-La, right. Yeah. Okay, so now as corporate counsel in labor and employment law, how big is your office and what kind of um, problems, challenges do you face with your uh, with Marriott International? Uh, for uh, my work as a corporate legal advisor for labor employment law, I am the sole counsel. Sole yeah. counsel? Sole counsel, yes. Meaning you don't have anybody else who has your particular experience or expertise to yes. handle your... It's a very unique line of practice. So we, Why is that? Because they are looking to you for thought leadership for technical advice, also for some of these commercial judgment call guidance. So you are there not just purely a technical lawyers who would go to the court to win the case, because for in house that's very different. We're also talking about 30 countries. You cannot, like a lot of countries, they operate in their local languages. They are not looking for that type of legal involvement, but what they seek your counsel is 
the the comfort when they're making the decision. They want to sure the comfort sure in making the a decision. decision. When the decision was made, then every scenario had been considered. Yes, they are prepared, and they know the consequences of what they walk into. I see. So, can you give us an example of maybe some of the types of corporate issues that you you've been working on? You you face. Yeah, sure. Uh, for all these actively managed hotels, you have these uh, hotel owners. They own the land, they own the building, they provide the funding capital to run the hotel. Then you also have hotel operators, so we are. Who are separate from so the separate, hotel yes. owners. Yes. So, but we say in most of the time, the operator and the owner, they have the combined win-win situation, common interest to run it. But there are occasions, for example, like you have a government down rate, wanted to know a certain government. down rate, wanted to know regulatory issues, uh, for mm -hmm. example, immigration law compliance in particular situations. Sometimes this is a, a good phase action by the government. Sometimes it's just like you don't know what really happened there. You need to figure it out. But when these things happen, you need to hand holding with the owners, with the operators, to make sure that we all work together. Yeah, to, Marriott International yes. is going to work together with the hotel yes. operators. Yes, to minimize the reputational impact to us, to minimize any legal risk to the owners. I see. So yeah. do you work in 30 different, how many languages, or do you speak, or do you have to get involved with translators? Or we do lawyers? have in-house translators. We have local councils in every country we operate. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, but for us, uh, foreign language skill is also very important to us. Okay. And I know you speak. Yeah, I speak Chinese, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I also had to do legal documents in the Chinese language. And English. Yes. Yeah, okay. So um, we all know that Starwood was just acquired by Merit, right? That was just completed fairly recently, right? Yeah, we are one combined company now. That happened one like two years ago. Yeah. Yes. And so wh what is the future of Merit? Do you see it getting more complicated and more acquisitions? that your work will change in any way? Well, I think that for this industry, there will be continued innovation in the field. We are not talking about the old school hotel operation anymore. For these days, the, the loyalty program is very important. Loyalty right? programs. Yes. Uh, and the digital areas, yes. Now when you walk into some of the Marriott hotels, you can experience mobile checking using your iPhone, become your room key. Oh, really? Yeah, you have all these technology experiences, so for us, we do have this partnership with different technology partners. I see. Mm -hmm. Do you get involved then in those contracts, or are you? Leaving? Yes, there will be different projects we have to look into it because there, whenever you do a project like this, there will be a significant change internally from people's uh, incentive, how task job uh, is being staffed, to the longer term, like do we make a permanent change to the corporate structure? So. Um, how do you keep up with the changes in the law? Are we talking about international law? Yes. Are we talking about labor law? Yeah, we're talking about the international labor employment practice in Asia. Actually, this is one of the most active field. In Hong Kong, we do have an in-house lawyer roundtable. Uh, we, yes, we meet from different company, multinational companies. All and doing we, labor law. Uh, they're doing a variety of things. Some of them are doing these uh, financial industry. Some of them are in this. Uh, commercial companies, but we meet every quarter, and we talk about the latest development in the field. And a lot of time, we meet 50% of the time, we're talking about people issue, HR issue, HR legal issues. Yes. Yes. Right. Do you do it in English or Chinese? Uh, we, we do all these languages. Yes. We have is, lawyers. Is, America, is English the... English, yes. We have English, but we, it's very interesting. You can see Australians working in Hong Kong for their whole life, and you can also see very smart Indian lawyers that like working in Singapore, and their company have a large base in India, but also have forefront in Singapore and Hong Kong. Do you have to travel a lot for what you're doing? Yes, we have to. We have where to, do you go? We, still, we have to visit our properties. We have to know what is going on in the field. Yeah, we have to hear all the feedback from the field to make the sound judgment. Right. And how long have you been with Marriott International in Hong Kong? Uh, for almost two years. Two years. Yes. And before that, I know oh, you haven't yeah. been in Hong Kong in the last 10 years. Yeah, before that, I was working in Shanghai for Accenture, a uh, technology consulting company. Then Is that an international company? Yes, it's, inter it's headquarters is in Chicago. Ah. Yeah. And what did you do for that? So for then, I was also doing the labor employment advisor for its greater China practice in mm -hmm. greater China. And 
And uh, how long were you there? I was there for five years, yes. And did you like it in Shanghai and in that company? Yeah, Shanghai has become very international yeah. over the past five years I experienced. When I like, came back to Shanghai, it's still one of the very beautiful Chinese city, but you feel the pace is different. You feel the culture, the way of life and working, uh, business uh, uh, ethics is different. But now it's very international. Right. So you, so both Accenture and Merit International, you were doing labor, you are doing yes. labor international. Is it the same type of practice, an international law practice that you it's could similar. easily transfer? It, it's similar uh, in a way, yes. But for Accenture, it has uh, much more issues on the operation side, because for Accenture, they do run this technology delivery center. We are talking about 10,000 people, 20,000 people in the technology delivery center, 24 hour. And where is that? Are they uh, all located in? They are located in India, China, Philippines, uh -huh. and Eastern Europe. Although you said it was headquartered in Chicago, so were you the, um, rep you do the lawyer for Asia again? Yes, yeah, so I was a lawyer for Asia, yes, for China, Greater China. Greater but then China. that's really a global, because for these type of business, you have a global contract, but it is going to be delivered somewhere in Asia. Then you have these clients based in the other side of the globe. Mm -hmm. And yeah. how many, how big is the legal counsel's office in Accenture? In Accenture China? is also, we are talking about all the lawyers getting together. It's like a mid sized international firm. And how it's big really, is that? Yeah, so we're talking about 500 lawyers globally. About 500 lawyers yes. globally. Yeah, that's a few years ago. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And so you, though, were the labor lawyer. Uh, for Accenture, for Shanghai, for the... For the Greater China, China. and for China. labor employment practice, Accenture, we have a global practice team. The global team has around 20 lawyers globally. I see. In almost every country we op operate, we operate around like 57 countries around the globe. I see. So, um, between the two, tell us a little bit the pace, because we know mm -hmm. in the U.S., private practice demands a lot of hours, billable mm -hmm. hours, mm -hmm. uh, weekends, evenings, um, a lot of uh, uh, not just billable hours, but outside work, whether it's mm. building a client base, mm -hmm. rainmaking, as we call it. What kind of uh, lifestyle do you have as an in house lawyer in, uh, at Accenture and at Marriott? I think, like in in house lawyer in Asia, the pace is quite similar to a private practice. That's in my view. Yes, yeah, you are the, because you cover a larger number of countries. Then you have a large number of issues going on. Usually traveling, traveling, too. and you also have to do these like corporate connectivities, like rainmakers. So yeah. you need to find more. You need to like let people know who you are. And you need to really understand the business. The way of doing that is to immerse yourself to the corporate structure. So it's not just narrowly doing your legal work. Yes, it's not just narrowly doing a piece of contract, because a contract in Asia, you have tons of international law firms have that practice in Asia. All this, they can like, spend some money to get the piece of the contract. Mm -hmm. But what they cannot get is somebody who knows the business, who have a vision, and who make a commercial a judgment. A much bigger yes. picture of the... Yeah. Yes, Landscape. Mm -hmm. Yes, and they, they prefer in Asia because the way of Asia is they prefer you getting connected personally. They don't want to see you as a robot behind the computer. They don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't have billable hours. We don't have billable hours. You do? We, we don't, but we have metrics. Oh, so you have these, metrics. Yeah, because these days, uh, you know how the big data or the technology advanced. Everything so, can be measured. Uh, everything can be me measured. We have scorecard. You have a metrics. scorecard? Yes. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> And so, can you tell us what are the metrics that you need to reach, for instance? Well, you have the customer satisfaction survey, yeah, you have the... And in this case, your customers, for, let's say, for Marriott, would be who? who there will be, be like the them? senior corporate persons. Yeah, you work day on day to day basis. Yeah. So they're actually in house people yes. who are your clients. Who are your clients, who, yeah. yeah. It's different, like for a private practice, sometimes. It's very rare you do a customer survey. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, this has been uh, fascinating. We've been talking to my guest, Jing Wu, who is mm. an international labor and employment specialist, mm. uh, visiting, coming back to Hawaii. And we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. That's you. I want to know. 
Will you watch my show? I hope you do. It's on Tuesdays at 1 o'clock, and it's out of the comfort zone, and I'll be your host, R.B. Kelly. See you there. Hello, I'm Cynthia Lee Sinclair. I have a show called Finding Respect in the Chaos. It's all about women's rights and gender equality. It's a place for survivors of abuse to come on and tell their stories, and a place for advocates to come on and share important resources so that people can get past the abuse and into the hope and healing that's on the other side. I hope you'll join me every other Friday at 3 o'clock for Finding Respect in the Chaos. I'm Cynthia Lee Sinclair on thinktechhawaii.com. Welcome back. This is Carol Monley on a special edition of Think Tech Global with my guest, Jing Wu, who is a uh, a law, who is a law graduate of UH Richardson School of Law and who has been practicing for 10 years in Asia in the labor and employment field. Uh, we've been talking about his practice, his corporate law practice, both at Marriott International in Hong Kong and at Accenture. Uh, at that time, it was, head, uh, well, the Asia headquarters is Shanghai, yes. right? So we talked about those two, but I know when you left Hawaii, where mm. did you go? I went back to Beijing. I joined a Chinese law firm that okay. time. That's Are you from Beijing? I'm from Shanghai, oh, but from, uh, that's an interesting story because when I was in law school, I took some of the classes from Professor Ron Brown, Professor Larry Foster, and Professor Allison Connor. These are fascinating classes to let you know about what's going on in Asia, and you know there is something called trend, like uh, international practice. You get into the field and you know like what these top issues people are dealing with. And that time, I think China is going through fascinating changes sure, in the legal system. Sure, the last 10 years, yes, last, last 15 years. Yeah, a lot of new law was returned. Like, they don't really know what to do when you had a new law. And the, the legal field, people are not prepared. Of course, you're talking about these New York firms. They are specialized in the capital market. They go into China. It's a big market to do. But there are a lot of uh, regulatory requirements other than this. Regulatory, thing. right. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, the labor employment practice, they wanted to like borrow the best from civil law countries, from common law jurisdictions. And they need people to advise on how to do it. And of course, people who are both bilingual, yes. fluent completely in English mm -hmm. uh, in, in law, and also, of course, speaking, reading, writing Chinese. Yes, so when I went back, I joined one of the largest Chinese law firms. In China, different, the law firm like to do large. Everything is mega size. Okay, You're what's talking the name about, of that law firm? Uh, King and Wood. That time called King, King and, and, and Wood. Wood. Right. The name was just a fictional name because there was <laughs> sounded very yeah. American. There was a partner by the name Mr. King, and there is also a partner by the name Mr. Wood. They saw these guys that own the company. <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> they were just employees working there. But they like the name. They like the name because that's easy to do business with. So for Americans, it's easy to spell and easy to send email. They, you won't get confused. Right. Yeah. So I was there in their labor labor employment practice group. For how long were you For there? about like two years, more than two years. I was there helping them to dealing with international clients and particularly a lot of litigation management. Nice. So we do have uh, foreign companies in China getting themselves into trouble, getting litigated through these employee claims. And you are not familiar with the court system. Uh, you don't know the rule procedures, but somehow there will be very serious consequences. You need somebody like walk you through to help you understand what's going on, to get prepared. And a lot of times, they have their in-house counsel. They have a lot of law firm based in the US. And because they don't speak the same legal language, sometimes it's painful. Uh, yeah. So how big was that firm? The firm was about 1,000 lawyers. Now it's like, I think, it's four, two, 3,000 lawyers. Uh, all in Beijing? Uh, no. All across China, all the major cities, yes. King and Wood. King and Wood, yes. Okay, and you were there for two years? Yes. And you were in a department then at that point, right? Not uh, just, you weren't the sole labor. I wasn't one. the sole. The, the department was really like a, talking about 20 lawyers at that time. I see. Yeah, but most of the lawyers, they're dealing with uh, pure local players. Mm -hmm. There are only a few lawyers can deal with the international players. And so did you deal with the local lawyers or mostly? Or uh, local lawyers, yeah. Because international, you have the international clients, but the legal issue is completely local issues. Okay. Sometimes there are crossover because we're talking about international assignments. Can you it's, give us an example of some of the local issues that might have uh, come across your desk? Yes, of course. So I give you an example. Some of the 
company 2008, at the time financial crisis, they are not doing, yes, 2008, right? 2010, they are not doing so good. They want to close their business, close their office. Uh, you think that it's the same in the US, you can liquidate the company, have the board resolutions, and you, you close the bank account, and you pay people, you leave. No, you don't. Not in China. <laughs> not in China. So there are specific, like three different work streams with the government. And before that, the people had to put you to the court system, they sue you in order to like, take the priority of the payment. Oh my goodness. Yes. Okay. Uh, so take, we're talking about two years, three years in this uh, process, process. To close a bit yeah. business. Yeah, sometimes these uh, companies get scared. They say, why we are getting sued? We haven't done anything wrong. We just have no business. It's financial crisis. Right. We yeah. don't have anything to keep going. Yes. So uh, has that changed? Uh, regulations or laws? Has been changed the, in the past ten years. I think it's getting much more clarity. Mm -hmm. Yes. There are no much less gray areas. Much less gray areas. Yes. So how would you compare then the private practice in Beijing versus your corporate practice, both in Hong Kong and Shanghai? I think the private practice is uh, quite different. It's more focused on these technical skills. You have to be good in court. You have to win the case. You have to be very aggressive, competitive. Yeah, but for corporate practice, you are practicing a different level of advocacy in the company. I see. You have to make great commercial judgment. And of course, you were just starting out in Beijing in private practice, so you weren't necessarily required to do any rainmaking. Any uh, yes, I wasn't. Yeah. But a lot of times, these clients they see a lawyer can speak their language. They were really happy to know you, and they sometimes they really get connected to you personally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they take to you, they introduce new business to you. So why did you decide to move from Beijing private practice to Shanghai? And no, I, practice? that time I was headhunted by Goldman Sachs in Hong Kong. That time they need somebody like to help them with their internal employee relations. They need somebody can as a lead, come from a legal background. Mm -hmm. and who is energetic, who is looking for a change, who can sit in on these banking trading floors and can do the employee relations. So then you went from Beijing Power Packs to Hong Kong yes. at Goldman Sachs. Yes. Then you went back, back to Shanghai. Shanghai. Yes. Then, okay, so tell us about Goldman Sachs. And so that's a very different uh, type of industry than... Yes, it's very there. type of industry. I think it's one of the best investment banks so far, and uh, everything we run with a high touch. And what did you specialize there? I was like their employment relations advisors. Okay. So a lot of time you're sitting in the room, like together with the compliance guy, together with the legal person. Uh, not you're not the legal person. We uh, we are not the legal person per you're se, right. but we are the person with legal education as the employee relations advisor. See, we we make sure these procedures, internal procedures, are fair to the employees. I see. We also so you're representing sure. the employee. Yeah, we we represent. We consider ourselves as a good conscience of the bank. Are the unions? Uh, they, no, no, they, it's not unionized. It's all professionals. Yeah. Yeah, it's not unionized, but you know, like sometimes you have all sort of sometimes personal issues, sometimes compliance issues, sometimes it's just bizarre <laughs> government investigations. Yeah. You want to make sure that these legal guys or compliance guys are not overreaching, being overly aggressive. Mm -hmm. You also want to make sure these employees do feel comfortable to cooperate with the investigations. And how yeah. big was the um, legal department or the department you were in at Goldman yeah, so Sachs? So Goldman Sachs was really small compared to like JP Morgan or Merrill Lynch because of the size. It's a smaller. We have two, about 2,000 bankers in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, the, and the legal the, department? Your the, department. We have like three employee advisors at that time, yes. So I'm the, one of the employee advisors in Hong Kong. Right. There is another employee relation advisor in Tokyo. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, so you've really had, in 10 years, you've had private practice in Beijing and then three different corporate experiences in, Hong, in, in Asia. Yes. Right? <laughs> covering thousands and thousands of people and different types of businesses. Yes, that's one of the things in Asia. Asia, everything evolves so fast. Mm -hmm. So you can see people do like make a lot of changes right. over the time. Because it's been growing. It's the growth yes. part mm -hmm. of the world. How did you, was it hard for you to get a job out of law school going straight to Beijing? So I think that's, I'm really fortunate during the law school time, I had some research with Professor Ron Brown. 
So I think he introduced me to the law firm in China. I see, King yeah. Louis, right? yes. Well, let's talk a little bit about while you were here in Hawaii. So you graduated from UH Law School in? In 2006. 2006, and before that, were you doing a simultaneous master's in the East-West Center? Yes, so I was doing a simultaneous master's, yes. I got the East-West Center scholarship. I got here in Honolulu in 2001, yes, and started to take some of the classes in For UH. Our master's. Yes. In political science, I also took some of the classes from the Department of Urban and Regional Planning. Yeah, I, I also see. took some classes like in law school, business school. And so then you applied to the law school. And yes, decided I decided to do something more like practical at, at that time. Yeah, because I, at that time I was young, I don't know what I'm <laughs> going to do after school. So we opened up any possibilities. Yes. Okay. So tell us about how you, UH Law School, because our law school. Uh, is very unique being mm. in Hawaii mm. and um, in the middle of the Pacific, mm. and we are very proud of our international mm -hmm. scope and, and depth of uh, courses. So tell mm. us, how, how did UH Law School prepare you then for this role in, as an international lawyer in Asia? I think the UH Law School really prepared me well for this. Uh, being here in Hawaii, we do have a vantage point like to connect East and West. And the law school classes, there are a lot of Asian-focused classes. I remember at that time, uh, we just started LLM program with all the these inter program, yeah, international right. lawyers. I think Spencer Kimura just came back from the mainland to run the program. So we also have a lot of uh, interaction students among the students with these lawyers from Japan, from Korea. So you do have the advantage to know like, what's outside the U.S. Right. So maybe we can explain the <laughs> LLM program at UH is uh, are for law graduates from other countries who already have a, a law degree but want to come to the United States and get an advanced degree. So they get mm -hmm. an LLM, a master's in law from the University of Hawaii Law School. And so they were integrated mm -hmm. uh, in your... Uh, they were integrated. Program. They were like sitting in the same class with us. So we don't feel like any different because of different programs. Yeah, we were in the same study group, same clinic classes. But yet they've already been lawyers and They've been lawyers, they've been practicing lawyers. Even for UH, I see most of the students are quite mature. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about people just out of college. There are a lot of working professionals coming back to law school, getting a second degree. So that enriched your experience yes. in terms of understanding mm -hmm. you know, other parts of the world in terms of practice. Yes. Okay. And so, what kind of courses did you take? You mentioned labor law with Ron Brown. Were yes. there other courses here that. There's a lot of Asian focused classes. I remember, like, there are specific, like, seminars regarding China, Japan, business. Business. And uh, mm -hmm. also, the Professor David Callis, the real estate classes. It was um, fascinating. Yeah, it's, it's really tough now. Yeah. Yeah. Right. People study hard for the exam. I still remember that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I know you did some immigration work too. While you yes, were I was also in immigration class. And UH Law School, I think one of the good, interesting things, we have a lot of adjunct professors from outside the school. Right. They're practitioners. Yes, so they, practitioners. So you're not just studying the book, you know, like we, we also went to uh, these prosecution clinic, legal aid clinic. Right, yeah. so you had great hands-on experience yeah. too. We just have a few seconds. If you want to just look into camera four mm -hmm. and tell everyone how they can get into an international law practice if that's what they're interested in. Yes, I think uh, you need to stay open-minded, be curious intellectually, and be open to changes. Yeah, if you are interested in hospitality, you can let me know, and we can do an internship in the summer. Wonderful. Well, yeah. thank you, Jing Wu. That was a, a wonderful offer to our viewers, if anyone's interested in international law. Well, that, our time went by so quickly. That brings us to the end of our show today. We have really enjoyed bringing it to you. I'm your host, Carol Man Lee. We've been talking about corporate law practice in Hong Kong's hospitality industry and beyond, uh, as well as practice in Beijing and Shanghai. If you want to see the show again, please go to thinktechhawaii.com or youtube.com slash thinktechhawaii, where there will be a link to this show and many more just like this one. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next time. Aloha.